you remember how I say how important it is to do a non-clinical course for every clinical course you do? I think that's super important because we are dealing with humans, we are dealing with emotions, we are communicators when we're in the practice. So I've brought on someone today who's gonna blow your mind. The lessons we share, and I need you to, guys, I need you to listen all the way to the end of this one because the main takeaway, my favorite thing that Prav Slanky shares with you today is gonna absolutely change the way of how you do social proof at your consultations. Now, what I, what I mean by that is this awkward moment in the consultation, uh, potentially a bigger case where you're like, well, let me show you some examples of my work kind of thing, right? That's what the sales gurus teach, right? It's, 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 it's funny because we need some sort of social proof because you should be proud of the work you did. And sometimes patients wanna see what other patients have had done because it's inspiration for them. But it's always very awkward to sort of you know, pull up a PowerPoint or whatever and, and, and show them what technique Prav teaches us is just fantastic. It's gonna change the way how you introduce that to your consultations in such an elegant manner. So that's around about the 50 minute mark or thereabouts, so towards the end, but there's so much value built in before then. We talk about that old thing, work-life balance, right? What is a balanced life look like? How we can actually live life more purposefully. That's the kind of themes that we cover with that. We also talk about the importance of pitching. Whether you like it or not, you are, we are constantly pitching to our patients, to our reception team, to our nurse, to our family. We are pitching all the time. So have you ever done an exercise where you've looked at your pitch? We, we kind of do that with you. So we're going to go through that as well. And finally, the importance of being a good storyteller or introducing stories into your consultations. And that's kind of like the main thing I want to take away. And the, the one word, the one magic word, this begins with M that uh, Prav taught me. And it's just an elegant way to, to build social proof, like I said. So I know you're going to gain so much. So I'm not going to talk on for too long. I want you to gain so much from this. So here we are. Over to you, Prav. Prav Solanke, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast, my friend. How are you? Um, really well, buddy. Um, I'm in London today. I'm in Enlighten's offices. I've got a couple of meetings Wait. in London. So um, I've just caught up with Payman um, and I've stolen his meeting room for, the, for this podcast. But, but I'm well. I was up at four o'clock this morning, did a mini workout, um, fasting. So I'm two day, I'll be two days in towards the end of this day, but I may, may just break it and go out with some food for pay. Very good. For those for those uh, who are familiar with the recent 72-hour fast I did, oh. I would not have been able to do it. It was for charity. I would not have been able to do it if it wasn't for, for pay. Pay has been <laughs> uh, a, a mentor in, in many ways, actually. You know, uh, I, I, it's a recurring theme, mentorship in this podcast, but Prav even uh, didn't even know that he he was... Uh, Prav did uh, pay as well, you know, love to pay. But Prav didn't even know that uh, the, the impact he had on me in the last couple of years, because I've just been following his um, social media for, I think, just about COVID time. Uh, in fact, the very first post of yours I saw, Prav, which tells me a lot about you as a person and your philosophy and your quirkisms, uh, is you posted a photo of your car and you had to take a train somewhere and you couldn't find a parking spot. And, and so you had to decide, <laughs> you had to decide, okay, what am I doing now? Do I miss the train? It was like, it wasn't a cheap train, right? Or do I get a parking fine? And then you said, okay, here's my, and you posted the photo of your car looking, uh, seeing better days, but you're like, you know what? There's a lesson to be learned here. And I was like, I like this guy. I like how he thinks. And that's when I first really connected. And I think the algorithm must have picked up that I like that post. And then your, your, your <laughs> kit just kept coming up, which is great. Uh, I love your sort of monologues and the, the camera and the car and stuff. So I obviously really, really enjoy all the content you post out. Uh, any any reflections based on that, uh, that event a few years ago, actually? Do you know what? It's like anything in life, buddy, that you've got to make that decision there and then, right? And it's one way or the other. And, and, and for me, I just evaluate things really quickly. Yeah. Um, with the car parking situation, it's, you know, it was really clear to me. It wasn't about the price. It wasn't about the cost, right? Even though there's a, you know, there's a valuation. The train was 150 quid. The car parking fine might have been 50 quid. So if you're just making a quick financial decision, boom, it's really easy, right? But more importantly, I was going to meet somebody. And if I was late for that person, then it would have thrown the whole value situation out of the window, mm. right? But yeah, I'm, I'm not really a massive rule breaker either, usually. But... But in that situation, it, it just had to be done. But but funnily enough, this morning I've, I've, I've done something similar. I've, I've broken a rule. I'll show you here. So my daughter loves uglies, yeah? I've never heard of them. Does that make me weird? No, it doesn't. It just means you don't get on the first class train. But <laughs> but neither do I anymore, right? So, <laughs> so, so, so back in the day, back in the day, I used to get first class train everywhere. And, and, and the reason being, 
is you can go to the lounge beforehand, right? So buying a first class ticket gets you access to a lounge, which is my, my office pre-train. Then I get off at the other side in London. Let's say I arrive in London at eight o'clock and I've got till one o'clock before my meeting. I've got from eight to one, I've got a desk. I've got food. I've got coffee on tap, right? I can apply value to that. And then I get a desk on the train where I can sit and work. I can justify that, right? I'm not, I'm not taking a first class train because I'm a snob. I just take that first class train because it makes sense. Post COVID, I took this first class train to London, the first train I took back, and I'm walking into the first class carriage and I see, what the f this, this um, premium standard. What the hell's premium standard, right? So um, I walk through, premium standards empty. So I make a mental note of that, go and sit down on the train. And because I'm fasting most of the time, A, I can't benefit from the food, the free food anymore, right? B, they've screwed up the lounge. So now you can only go into the lounge at Euston if you're departing and you can only go in there one hour before, before you go nuts for a full day, right? So, the, so that's all messed up. At my end in crew, the lounge opens at half past seven in the morning, far too late for me, right? So there's no benefit. Premium standard is like first class, but you don't get the food <laughs> and you don't get the lounge. Well, I, I can't take advantage of that anyway, right? But the other downside is every time I used to get into first class, I'd pick up these uglies for my daughter, yeah? And these, these are little chocolate treats that my daughter absolutely adores. And this is my 19 year old daughter, by the way, right? So yesterday evening I'm speaking to her and she goes, um, pick some uglies up for me. I said, I can't, I'm in premium standard. I can't get uglies for you. She's like, <laughs> give him a sob story. Tell him your daughter wants some uglies, right? I said, I don't even get the opportunity to tell him a sub story because no one comes and serves you in premium standard, right? <laughs> so I get into Houston. I know we're going off topic here, but we get, I get uh -huh. into Houston up the escalator, walk into first class lounge, right? The lady goes, can I see your ticket? I bolt past her and say, I'm gonna piss my pants if I don't go to the toilet. So I leg it straight into the toilet. The, the first part of that story was actually true. I did need the toilet, right? But on my way out, I grab a handful of ugly, stick them in my pocket and just walk out and give a <laughs> nod to the lady, right? I've got uglies for my daughter, man. I've achieved my goal for today, right? Um, and so I sent her a little photograph and she said, how? So I'm going to tell her that story later on. And we're going to talk about storytelling later, right? Um, I, I was anyway. just going to say, because what, what you did there is uh, you shared some a lesson, you shared a story. Uh, and, and that's one of the themes I'm going to cover today. Like, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of everything that you put out. And a lot of what you put out is story based. And I've, I've noticed that a lot of what we put out is stories based. And I think that's really powerful. And I want to be able to help the dentist, the producer, auntie who listen and watch with that, because it's a theme I've covered before, that uh, and something that Zach Cara, uh, my friend, uh, said that uh, facts tell, stories sell. And it's not about selling, but it is about growth. It is about business. I am very, very clear on my podcast that in an ideal world, for every clinical course you do, we should do a non-clinical course. And what I want you to bring you on for is give everyone a bit of a taster of what, you know, what kind of lessons we can learn non-clinical. Uh, I do a lot of those now because there's an interference cast arm of the of the podcast, which is which is growing, growing, getting lots more uh, engagement on that sometimes more than the clinical stuff nowadays because people really resonate with the non-clinical realities of being a dentist. So why don't we go, uh, before we just talk about stories maybe, because it just weaves mm -hmm. nicely, then we'll talk about um, uh, the, the, in fact, let's save stories because I want to do a little full circle. So you want to learn more about stories, we'll come around. You have to stay to the end to come stories. Uh, just when we start talking about the power of a pitch, Prab, just tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, you're, you and Pei are the, the, the fantastic hosts of Dental Leaders, but your story, if you just give us a little bit of a story about, you know, your um, university, interesting university experience and, and how you came to be the, the marketing uh, dentrepreneur as you are uh, today. So Jazz, I'll, I'll give you the, the quick sort of route around this. So, you know, I was destined to be either a medical researcher or a, or a doctor, right? You know, growing up in a traditional Indian family, right? Doctor, dentist, accountant, you know, and, and, and make your parents proud and all the rest of it. As a, as a young Asian kid, I think you sold a story, right? A story about success. Um, and my parents or my father's idea of success is completely different to mine. And, and his thinking has now changed anyway, right? And, and for me, success really revolves around being able to do what you want, when you want, with whoever you want, 
without any financial constraints, right? That's that's success for me. Um, not putting a badge on you saying you're a doctor, you're a dentist or whatever, right? And and, and if you get there, wonderful. Um, cut a long story short, you know, I went down that traditional route, went to, I was at university for the best part of 10 years, studying medicine, doing a PhD in pharmacology. And towards, this was at Oxford? At Oxford University, yeah, yeah. Um, towards the end of that, um, and. And the backstory behind my PhD, it was fully funded. I'd won a Wellcome Trust scholarship. But the beauty of that is it's not to sort of say, hey, I won this scholarship. It was actually, it was a fully funded gig, right? So it was four years funded. I'd finished my PhD in three years, but I had to stretch this bad boy out to make the most of the funding, right? So I, the last year was was plain sailing, right? Because my, my um, thesis was written up. I was ready for my Viva. Um, but I had 12 months of happy days. So it was at that point my brother was launching. He, he first launched Kiss Dental right back in 2005. He was sat there having long lunch breaks. The practice wasn't really doing much, uh, but he'd come up with, a, with an amazing name and brand, Kiss Dental, right? So he said, hey, bro, um, fancy giving us a hand with this marketing stuff. I knew nothing about marketing, right, at that point. <laughs> but Jazz, I knew this, right? If I could learn the names of every single blood vessel from head to toe and the innovation of every nerve from head to toe and the bloody Krebs cycle and, and, and all the biochemistry and the pharmacology and all the rest of it, I reckon I could figure out this marketing luck, right? So that was a challenge I took. I had a lot of spare time on my hands. So I learned things like Google ads, made a lot of mistakes, did some video, um, some TV ads, some some radio ads, some newspaper ads, you name it. Cut a long story short, in a short space of time, Kiss Dental became a success. My brother at the time was on the Paul Tipton like course. That was the course back in the day to do, right? So he was on that. And all his colleagues on that course were asking him questions. Hey, who does your marketing, mate? What, what happened? How did you do this? My brother said, speak to this guy called Prav. Didn't tell anyone. <laughs> didn't tell anyone we were brothers, right? And I guess there were, in his mind, the reason behind that was he didn't want the affiliation and the association, right? He, he just wanted to say, I'll let you make your own way, so to speak, right? Don't pedal off the back. Whatever his reason was. That came and bit me on the arse a little bit later, right? Because we, we, we didn't really... I wasn't transparent about that, and it's not the way I operate now, right? Uh, but anyway, cut a long story short, by the time I'd vivered for my PhD, I had about 10, 12 customers, okay? I was charging buttons, mate, absolutely buttons. The first website I built for a client, I coded myself and I charged 250 quid for it, and I reckon I put in about 400 hours into that website, right? Wow. It, I knew nothing, you know, and I was learning the ropes and all the rest of it, and, and I knew nothing about value or, or respect in my own value. And then a client of mine, um, and I'll shout him out, it's Dr. Ritten Patel. Um, he's got a practice in um, Walton on Thames. He picked up the phone and he goes, do you know what, Prav? What you've done for my practice has completely turned it around. And I'm going to ask you to increase your fees fivefold. But I'll wow. only agree to pay you fivefold if you write to all your customers and do the same. Yeah, I didn't have the balls to wow, do that. Wow, what a legend! What a f***ing hero, man! What what a top what an absolute guy. legend! We need more of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I've heard something similar in terms of you know, look, what you did was great value, and someone appreciated it. And sometimes I don't want to you know blow the trumpet, or whatever. But with, with this podcast and and some of the little mini course that I have. It's so damn like I got a ninety dollar course on Reservoir and Bridges, which is you know the, I charge nine hundred pounds for Reservoir and Bridge. I know it's incredible value, and I love mm. it when dentists mess me saying, "Jazz, can I pay you four hundred pounds for this?" I'm like, "No." So there are these dentists. You know, we, there's this perception that dentists are greedy and whatnot. But I think the you know when the mindset is correct and people want to reciprocate, they understand that okay, what has value and what doesn't. So really, hats off that dentist for for giving you what you needed at that time. I think. And this was way back in the day, right? Where he he could have carried on just just rinsing that for what it was right um and i'd say he gave me that kickstart in my career to to, to really teach me the value of value <laughs> you know and so i didn't i didn't do as he said and i carried on and then he picked up the phone and goes prav you do what i've told you 80 percent of your customers say you're too expensive so they go now you're doing 20 percent of the work and earning the same money what the f is wrong with you and it was that conversation 
that really made that switch. And I lost one customer after writing that email, mate. Yeah, lost one customer. That was it. Impressive. Um, and do you know what, Jazz? From that moment onwards, things changed. Um, I started, I guess, providing more value, being able to afford to hire people. Um, you know, and, and I went from a point of hiring people based on cheap, okay, um, hiring people, you know, who, who I could afford at the time, to then saying I want the best. I want the best copywriter. I want the best software developer. I want the best of this, that, and the other, and I'm going to charge a premium for it, right? And I'm going to offer a premium service. Um, and things just change when you do that, buddy. When you, you, Everyone knows in their dental practices as well, in their clinics, right? When you hire good quality, you know, emotionally intelligent team members, they change your entire patient experience, right? And, and for me- The culture of the practice. Everything, mate. Yeah, whether it's the culture of the practice, the culture of a marketing team, your business, whatever it is, um, it all changes. But if you're hiring based on an hourly rate, you know, you're just exchanging money for time. Pay, pay peanuts to get monkeys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, anyway, where was I going to digress? So we take that story full circle, right? Um, and I'm just going to fast forward to where I am today rather than just going through the whole, whole story, right? So since then, um, I launched my marketing agency, which is what, 15, 16 years ago now, right? Since then, I've become a practice owner. Um, I've sold practices. So then I became a co-owner of the IAS Academy. Um, and then I've got into developing bits of software to help dental practices grow, so on and so forth. And, and I'm always interested in opportunities. But during that whole journey, Jazz, um, it doesn't come easy, right? You gotta sacrifice a few things, right? Whether it be mm -hmm. work-life balance, whether it be kids, whether it be your other half, right? And your relationship mm -hmm. with them. Um, or your relationship with health or food or, or whatever whatever that may be, right? And we all do that to different extents. It's like a sliding scale, right? So Prav may get fat and let his health go, right? Um, someone else may start neglecting their wife or their partner or whatever, right? And someone else may just shut off from the kids. And I've got business partners in all of these businesses who've done all of that to a different degree, right? We all know that running a business well, well, the, isn't the, easy. The, the perfect thing I want to say now is just it leads so well to one of the questions I want to ask about work-life balance. And I, I know how you've done that, so well done. You weave that in perfectly. But actually, one thing I didn't send you is the, the, the backstory of this is when I was 17, again, a story, I'm sharing a story now. When I was 17, I was doing a drama. No, when I was 16, 16, I was doing drama GCSE. So this may come as a, no surprise that I did a GCSE drama. I almost took it to A-level. Um, like I almost like had this aspiration at the time of, of going into acting, actually. I, I was very much interested in that. So when I look at now that who's living my best life, I think the singing dentist is living my best life, right? It's, it's, it's just creative, it's so good, it's so fun. But anyway, so I, I kind of like, it makes sense how I'm in this podcast and I'm in this, you know, crazy things that I do. So it all sort of makes sense when you look at your history and your background. But anyway, my drama teacher at the time, Miss, Miss Wyndham, she came up to, to, to me and the, gr the, the group that were doing drama. Uh, and I don't know why she said, she must have seen something that maybe we were, we were burning the, the, the candles at both ends. I think that's how the saying goes. And she said, guys, I'm gonna tell you a lesson. And she was Australian, so I'm not gonna do the Australian accent. But she said to us, guys, just remember for the rest of your life and career that of these three things, this, is, this was her philosophy. And I'm, I'm, I'm betting that your philosophy is different. I'm betting. But um, her philosophy was there are three things, you have to pick two, okay? So work, social life, and health. Right? Okay. So work, social life, health, pick two, because the third one you won't be able to achieve. You could only have two. Which two will you go for? So that was her mantra. That was her mindset that she was sharing with us. So my question to you is, A, what do you think about Miss Wyndham? Do you think she's right? Or can we have our cake and eat it? Can we do a fully balanced life? What does that even look like? What is balance? Because you know, you're so well connected, uh, dentists and family, dentists like, you know, through IAS and so many clients, you know more dentists than I do probably. And you know their stories. What does balance look like? Is Miss Wyndham right? Do you know what? Balance is different for everyone, um, Jazz. Um, and, and, you know, I th based on my philosophy, Miss Wyndham's wrong. Yeah, there's the short answer to your question. Um, <laughs> and, but but in her mind she's right okay because because she can't see past being able to focus on two things at once okay she can't see past that and there'll be people who say well i can't multitask or i can't do this that and the other right um i think balance 
looks several aspects of your life, Jazz, and, and I'll give you my take on it, but this doesn't mm. mean that... This, this, this is not necessarily an endorsement of, you know, pr- follow Prav's way, right? We all, we all have our own ideas of, of what balance is, right? But for me, balance revolves around that definition of success that I, that I gave earlier, right? Being able to do what I want, with who I want, when I want, wherever I want, without any financial constraints, right? And, that, and that's my definition of success. But to be able to do that, you need to have all the different areas of your life in check. And, you know, where I take inspiration from is um, you, you may or may not have heard of the Wheel of Life, right? Or the different incarnations you of it. You told me about it recently in our, one of our Zoom chats, but no, I want you to share it with everyone. Apps. Yeah. Um, and the way I look at it is that, let me give you an example, um, Jazz. And maybe, maybe you don't have bust ups with your missus, right? But I have them. Okay. And if I've had a bust up with my missus that morning, and then I've got to go to work and do a good piece of work. I guarantee you it'll be <laughs> Maybe not shit, but I guarantee you it will not be optimal. Why? Because I love that lady to bits and she means the world to me, right? And mm-hmm. the anxiety mm-hmm. that's going to be burning in here is going to distract me from my mission. Yeah? And the same can apply to anything else, right? There's nothing quite like a health scare to, to reset your work-life balance. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, And so when you look at all different aspects of your life, your physical health, your career and professional development, finance, relationships with with your other half, right? Whether it comes down to, you know, just being happy with that person, being present in the moment, having an amazing sex life, whatever it is, right, revolves around that relationship, right? Sometimes we're too scared to talk about that stuff, right? Um, But it's important. And then friends. Like I look at my uni, like my best, best friends in the whole world, right? I can count them on my fingers, yeah? And those best friends, I may not see them for three, four years because they're all over the place, right? But I can pick up the phone to Jason and say, hey, buddy, how's it going? Um, I need you here in Manchester. He'll drop everything and come to Manchester, right? But the moment me and Jason connect, even if we haven't connected for three years, yeah, Buddy, it's like taking a step back in time, yeah? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and we're best mates, okay? And, and, and having that time with just mates, friends, not your, not your partner, not your relationships, and I know, okay, we, we marry our best friends and all the rest of it, right? But then you have your, your boys or your girls or your buddies or whatever, right? There's that time, yeah? And, and, and that's important for, for our own inner sort of well-being, right? I'm a big fan of that, and Simon Sinek talks about that. All the uh, the oxytocin and the and the group and the community and and having social interactions, tribal interactions, are so important to your overall well being. Just like you said, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of that philosophy as well. So important, right? And then, and then you know, this may sound a little bit woo woo, right? But sort of mental and spiritual well being as well, and. Um, and, and spirituality or whatever, it can mean different things to different people once again, right? To, to some, they anchor it to religion. To some, it might just be five minutes of meditation. It might be going for a walk in the woods, right? With a cup of coffee or whatever, right? But, but, but that, that, that place where you're at peace with yourself and you're comfortable being lonely, that, 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 that's, that, that's my thing, right? And, and whether I'm doing my breathing exercises in the morning or I just go for a walk in the garden when, when the birds are tweeting and I've got a cu- cup of coffee in my hand, whatever that is, it's having all those in balance, right? And, and, and that's where I think a balanced life is. And, and you talk, we talk about this wheel of life and there's an exercise that you can do which you say, okay, well, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how good do you think your physical health, where, where do you think your physical health is? Where do you think your relationship with your partner is? Where do you think your relationship with your dad, your mom, your brother, your sister, your top five friends? Um, how much selfish time do you get for just you, just prav time, right? How much prav time do you get where you can do whatever the hell you want to do when you want to do it, okay? And what about spiritually, mentally? How do you feel about your career progression and where that's going right now? I challenge anyone to score that, you know, one to 10 and score 10 in every area. It just doesn't happen, right? You, you, I, I repeat that exercise all the time and my numbers are all over the flipping place, yeah? 
And I try myself. Prab, can I just give a shout out? Can I just give a shout out to someone based on what you said? I want to give a shout out to uh, my my now ex principal Hapgill in Richmond, who maybe we as a team didn't see the value or the purpose of it at the time because it was like I'm already so busy, I've got to do this now. Is he'd give us this uh, sheet with all these like it's like two side sheet with all these questions, and it was pretty much based on all that. Like right out of ten, mm. you know, um, do you feel you make enough money? Do you feel you have enough time with your uh, children? Like all those various things, so many different metrics, kind of like the wheel, but not in a wheel representation. And then, so then he'd actually block out time. He's a busy uh, principal here in a high-end work. He'd block out a half an hour with you, sit down with you and go through it. No principal has to do that with his associate. Doesn't, you know, and, and I just really look back and I think, and, and then he keeps his old ones, keeps your old ones to compare. And it's such a wonderful thing, and I, I respect the fact that you do it, and there's something that you c c condone. I think we, sh we should all have this uh, as a regular thing. Maybe you should have something in your diary. I don't know how often you recommend Prav, but maybe every six months, every year. W w when is a good time to check in with yourself? I don't, so so I, I'm a big believer in, and, and look, you could, we can all set goals at different stages and stuff. I check in with myself like once a quarter, right? Every, every 90 days or so. Every 90 days, I'll, I'll go through my wheel of life, sit down. I actually sit down with my wife and uh, uh, we make a list of things that, that, that piss each other off about, about each other. I yeah. love this. Um, and then, and then we, we, we talk to each other about how we can fix that for each other rather than fixing it for ourselves. Um, I'm, I do I'm my, so going to do this, mate. Yeah, I, I, I do my wheel. I do a full panel of blood tests. Yeah. And look, you know, people say to me, oh, why, why, why the hell do you get your bloods done every three months? Yeah. You freaking dentists are telling me to get my teeth cleaned every six months. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and to not check your cholesterol or your, 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 you know, your, your kidney HB1 function or your li liver function or, or, or your diabetic risk score or whatever, right? It's mental. Yeah. And it's so affordable today. Right, there's services that come to your home. That phlebotomist comes to your house, and you get it on the dashboard. Like, there's no excuse now, right, not to do that. Um, so, so, so yeah, I I tend to check in and, and and do that, right. And and you know, the important part of let's say growing a business or growing your life or, or you know trying to achieve success or, or whatever happiness is, right, is taking that time out to think and reflect on yourself and on your life. Because if we're busy in that rat race all the time. Right. What we say that, you know, especially in business, do you know when, when do your best ideas or your best thoughts come to you when you ain't got nothing to do? Right. For, for me, for me. Right. I'm taking a walk in the park. I'm with the kids or whatever. Or I'm taking a <laughs> shit. Yeah. But, those, <laughs> but 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 those best toilet ideas. Toilet university. Toilet university, <laughs> mate. But those moments <laughs> of inspiration, those best. They don't come to you when you're deep in work. Right when you're putting processes together, when you're delegating to your team, they come to you when you're away from all the noise. Well, the, I think the take home there is because we've got a few more areas to cover. Is have a check in with yourself, take a look at Zig Ziglar's uh, Wheel of Life, have a, a way to check in with yourself to see how you're doing. And I, I, I personally think uh, yes, Miss Wyndham was wrong. However, when I look back at my last uh, nine years at dentist, before my son came along, I was very much into the gym. I had to sacrifice that. For my son, and I'm, you know, I'm totally happy I did, but I'm always thinking, okay, how can I tweak my life to make more time for my health? So it's it's a constant reflection, not just going on autopilot. So now every Tuesday and Thursday, me and my principal, we, we do a little workout, even if it's just something, just to feel like uh, we get some social time to have a chat and we get some exercise in. Uh, but like at various points in your life, depending on where you are in which phase of life you're in, balance will be the best you can achieve in that phase. Like you mentioned fat prav, right? When you were fat prav, right, you had other things going on that was, you know, at the time that had to be done. And that that had, you know, you, you couldn't have done it any other way. But you you you've learned you 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 sort of adapted your lifestyle based on that. But let, let me just let me just pick up on that, Jazz. You know, we, we we're talking about balance here and not having time. Yeah. Um, and I mentioned earlier, there's nothing quite like a health scare to reset, to reset that work-life balance, right? You know, you, you can't, afford, you can't do this thing, right? When we talk about those, the wheel of life or the different things, right? We can prioritize, right? Whether it's segmenting time, you've said on on the two days a week, you you, you do the exercise with your principal, right? Why is it not more than two days a week? Is that is that because your health only prioritizes? For two days a week, um, you don't well, have. It must be at the moment. That's how much value I'm giving to my health, that, which is that, a shame. But yeah, 
that's how much value you're giving to your, to your health, right? And, and for me at the moment, right, um, people talk about non-negotiables, given whatever buzzwords you want, right? But, but for me, there's a, there's a bit of sacred time in the morning. There'll be an intense workout. There'll be a little bit of the equivalent of whatever you want to consider meditation to be, breathing exercises, whatever, right? And then I start my day. The harder the workout, the easier the day. Mm-hmm. It really, it, it really is that for, for me, Jazz. And, and so depending on those different areas of life, we can prioritize it. I don't buy any bullshit that you tell me if you tell me you haven't got seven minutes every morning to work out. Agreed. Uh, do a quick hit worker. I absolutely agree. It's 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 the lies you tell yourselves, uh, and I'm hundred yeah. percent with you, buddy. Hundred percent with you. And but but we tell ourselves this story, right? Fat Prav was telling him, himself this story that it was a hundred percent tunnel vision. It was work. He didn't have time to cook. You, you don't or anything. mind that, right? You, you don't mind that I went there, right? You, you're cool, no, right? No, 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 <laughs> buddy. I don't. I don't. I'm not at all, right? Um, and 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 the whole thing was, well, what was Fat, Fat Prav doing? He was getting a subway on his way into work, right? Um, and he'd stack up on the cookies to have throughout the day, right? And then on his way back from work, it'd be dominoes, right? And, and honestly, I'm disgusted at myself now, right? You know who my passenger was on the way home from work? It was a cardboard box, yeah? With a hot dominoes in there, yeah? And, <laughs> and, 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 and I'd have peppers all down. Do, do you know what I mean? Didn't have time to stop and eat because I was so bloody busy. Yeah. yeah, I was telling myself some bullshit story, right? Guys, and- this is the same Prab who who uh, blogged about his 21 day fast experience. Just just liquids, just water and black coffee only. Um, it, you, I, I'm going to share that link in in the blog post because you need to read about how much mental strength you need and you know based on uh, what you're telling us about fat prav and to go to the extreme obviously don't try this at home get seek medical care try a 24-hour thing first but you know this is a, a separate conversation but the reason i mentioned that is just so much i learned from reading that and it inspired me uh, and also it just it talks a lot about your humor because it was like a day by day um <laughs> poo by poo account I, I just love that so much you know i think <laughs> we have very similar toilet humor um, uh, prav can i ask you about can we just uh, switch gears now and talk about of course the importance of having a pitch. So we just covered a uh, balanced life. We touched a little bit on stories and we're going to finish on stories, but having a pitch, I first realized that I need to have a pitch when I went to a talk by a chap called Daniel Priestley. Uh, and he says that we're, you know, whether you realize it or not, you're always pitching, whether that's pitching to your patients, to your nurse, to your reception team, to your other half, you are pitching something always, you're oozing something from your social media, from your real life. And that messaging, what you stand for needs to be clear. And it really got driven home for me, Prav, recently when I went to one of Riaz's Riaz's course, a good buddy Mm. of mine, and uh, we were talking a little bit about how he presents treatment plans. And then he said, he took a a step back and said, you know what? When my patients go through a treatment process with me, they don't buy the treatment, they buy me. And then so how can we bridge that gap? I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're pointing to yourself, you absolutely agree with that. How can we, and here, here's just me adding my piece for the real expert, i.e. you, tells us about uh, the importance of pitching and how to do it. But what I took away from that is, and, and something that uh, Riaz does is, how I implemented that. So knowledge is nothing without implementation. How I implemented that into my daily uh, work is now when I have a new patient consultation, Invisalign or or ClickRect or or, or whatever, uh, you name it, I am going to introduce myself, pitch for 30 seconds. I'm Jazz. I'm about minimally invasive dentistry, healthy smiles. I'm, re- I'm a, re- a bit of a geek. I love it. I'm a family man. Here's a photo you know, of my family. Uh, this is me. Uh, and I care deeply about my patients. And I'm so glad you're here. Kind of thing. So now they just know about me. And then we talk about the teeth and stuff. So I like to set the scene like that. And that's where I, I took that uh, message further in terms of pitching. So, Prav, over to you as the, um, the sort of someone who teaches dentists how to pitch. What is the, you know, how important is pitching? So before I get into that, I'm just gonna very briefly touch on something called imposter syndrome, right? Because the majority of dentists I speak to about pitching their USP or their story or whatever, right? There's always someone who's got more experience in placing implants. There's always someone who's done more aligner cases. There's always someone who's better at sculpting composite on front of teeth, right? There always is, right? So this imposter syndrome kicks in, right? How can I say something amazing about myself when, when all my competitors are out there doing amazing things or, or, or whatever, right? So, so there's that whole thing about imposter syndrome. And my one rebuttal to that, Jazz, is I am the world expert at being Prav Silanke. And there ain't no human being better than me at being Prav Silanke. 
And you are the world expert at being Jazz Galati, and, and we can take that message on, right? Okay. Now, the way another dentist may deliver dentistry may be in a more caring way. They may, they may be better with um, phobic patients, more gentle. You may be the dentist who goes out to the waiting room and gets down at their level, bends down and says, hi, Prav, put your hand on them. I know you're really nervous. I've got your notes in there, and, and, and but there's nothing to worry about, right? That patient's not going to give a shit about the flipping translucency on their composites, right? Or whatever you want to call it, right? I'm not going to shoot. But, <laughs> but there's every, we've all got our own USP, right? And, and, and call it a USP or, or our inner ways of working, right? We're, we're all individual and world experts at being ourselves. So, so like set the stage with that first, okay? And then your pitch really, the, the way I speak to dentists about how they should get their go. Sorry, Jazz, go on. I just want to say something before you then come to the pitch bit, because you mentioned about uh, imposter syndrome, something that I, I know we've had talks about this. You suffer from yeah. it at times. All I suffer from it. And I'm a big believer that actually we need the imposter syndrome to, to do the work, to actually do our amazing things that we do, basically. It, it, it is something that we need. And then it's, it's, yeah, it's deeply seated in our profession and everyone suffers. It's, it's a good thing to have, actually. And, you, know, you need to see it as a, as a, as a positive. I'm going to just share a lesson from uh, Gary Vee, who's so big on you know social media and that kind of stuff. The leaf I've taken from him is that with, with myself putting myself out there so much on social media, it was a big step for me. Like I'm just, you know, going gung-ho, I'm repurposing. I'm like in everyone's faces now on social media. And I've had, you know, it took a lot of uh, courage to put my, stick my head above the parapet to do that. But I've come to a stage now where I am, I back myself, you know, in cricket, they say you back yourself. I back myself enough that, you know what? I, I, um, I have stories to share. I have dentists that I can help through, through getting on great, great guests like yourself and whatnot on the show uh, and sharing my own nuggets. So I, I own the fact that, yes, I am Jazz Glati and I, I, I can give the quirkisms that only I can give. But I'm also self-aware enough to know that I am nothing, right? There are so many people that know more than me and I want to actually bring them on and, and share their stuff, right? And, I, and I'm ha always happy to say that, you know what? I don't know this and I don't know that. And then it's respecting you don't know what you don't know. So the combination of that is what keeps me going, basically. So I just wanted to add that in because some people may need to hear that from, from a Gary V's perspective. And I really like that, actually. I think, you know, you've got a really valid point there, Jazz, which is the whole, you know, when it, when it comes to imposter syndrome, right, certainly for me, it drives me to do my very best because when you suffer from imposter syndrome, you know what you don't know, right? That's the whole, that's the whole premise of it. You know what you don't know. And so you make sure that you try and fill those knowledge gaps. You, you, you make your slides perfect, your presentation and whatever, right? And, and, and we, you know, the total opposite of that, right? The, the, the Dunning-Kruger effect, you know, unskilled and unaware of it, right? Is that person with bags of confidence, right? But they don't know their limitations. They don't, I think that's far worse than imposter syndrome, right? Fake it till you make it syndrome or whatever whatever you want to call it, right? The, the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I'd rather be that guy who's got imposter syndrome um, and be aware of what my limitations are, what I don't know. Maybe as a dentist, that's even more important where, you know, um, you know which cases not to treat, yeah, how far you can you can take things. Uh, Painful lessons learned. When I speak to my clients about getting their pitch right, okay, the first thing you've got to do is go on like a self-discovery process of like, what is it about me that my patients love, right? How do you find that out, okay? Um, a really good way to find out and, and how I discover about my clients, I go and read their Google reviews, right? Because it's what patients have written in their own words, about those clinicians and you get those little nuggets, right? If you spend, and if you've got a lot of reviews, right? If you just spent a little bit of time reading those Google reviews, you'll figure out what that dentists or clinicians or practices USPs are very quickly, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna give you another tip that'll really help you figure that out in a second. Um, so, so, you, so you've got that, that you, you figure out what, what you're all about, right? And then your pitch, I usually come up with two. So there's my pitch in the first person that I would give to you as my patient, okay? Before I've even had the opportunity to do that, there's a team member who's speaking to potential patients on the phone about Prav, about Jazz, about whoever the clinician is, right? 
that's the first pitch that you need to nail, right? Mm. And you need, so, 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 so I always, I always get, sit down with the dentist, sit down with the team and say, okay, if you're booking an appointment with Dr. Chohan in my practice, right? What are they going to leave with? What's the minimum amount of information they're going to leave with? And how are you going to make that phone call memorable, right? What's really important is memorable phone calls because we'd have to be deluded to think, especially when patients are making a large investment, that they're only ringing my practice, yeah? It's their money. It's their choice. They can ring half a dozen practices and go back and say, do you know what Kerry said to me about Dr. Johan? That's really resonated with me. Yeah. So let's say you go through your your whole discovery, learning the patient's pain points and all the rest of it. And then Kerry turns around to that patient and says, look, I know you're really nervous about dentistry, right? I know you're nervous and you haven't been to the dentist in about 10 years. But rest assured, Dr. Chohan is incredibly gentle. He'll come out to reception and meet you. And you can just have a chat in the lounge if you want. You don't need to step out in the surgery. When it comes to implant dentistry, he works with a sedation dentist who can put you into a relaxed, dreamlike state so that you you, you won't have much awareness of, of, of really what's happening at the time. You won't feel any pain. But before you get to that state, just to let you know, he's placed in excess of 5,000 implants in his career. Everything from really simple stuff to the complex stuff. Um, and other dentists from the local area send all their complex work to Suresh when they can't do it. I'd love to invite you just to come in and have a meeting with Suresh and learn if he's the right person you'd like to trust with your teeth. And then that lady gets on the phone and speaks to another clinic and says, I'm interested in dental implants. Yeah, no problem. Our implants start from three and a half thousand pounds. If you'd like to book a free consultation, is a 35 pound fully refundable deposit. Can I get you booked in for that, right? Nothing wrong with what she said, right? But my phone call's more memorable. Do you, do you understand where I'm coming from in terms 100%. of the pitch? And so, and so the, the takeaway here, guys, is check out your Google reviews, come up with your own personal pitch, get an idea of it, and then such an amazing gem. Make sure the receptionist, like the people who pick up the phone are so important to your business beyond belief. And so do they have a pitch for you? And that's what Prav means in terms of having a first person one and and, and a, was it be a second or third person? Third I, I don't person. know how it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so, so that, that that is a key. Uh, anything else on pitching? Because I want to get to the stories before we can wrap up this uh, very, uh, wow, pa- jam-packed uh, episode so far. Uh, anything else on pitching? Because I know you got a course on this and I want to tell people how to get onto it because I'm going to cover in, in depth. This podcast is more about the breadth and getting people to, to think, oh, do I have a pitch? Do I not, basically? So uh, anything else on pitching, Prof? Just a very quick tip, okay? We spend a lot of time with our patients in consultations. We ask the right questions on a scale of one to 10, wave your magic wand, blah, 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 all, all of this sort of stuff to get the gold out of the patients. And then we resonate with them. And, and you know, like we said earlier, we're not, we're not selling porcelain, right? We're selling human beings here, right? We're selling us. The one, the, 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 the times where we've learned more about our patients learn the most about our patients has been when we've sat down with them post treatment spent a lot of time with them and talked to them about the things that they wouldn't share with us in the consultation now now in in, in my clinic jazz um we're very privileged in the fact that these patients invite us to come and spend that time with them in their own homes and we sit down with them when we talk to them about what was life like before Can you just take me back to your car journey when you're on the way to the consultation? What were you feeling? Was your heart racing? What were you thinking? Can you take me back to the car journey when you'd left the consultation? How did that feel? You know, they'll talk about hope and things like that, right? Then we sit down and talk to their husbands, wives, children, et cetera, et cetera, and take things from there. And that is such a cool way of finding out about your patients, really, truly, what they experienced. So I, I love how you go in someone's home and you collect those stories. And I've seen, I've been lucky enough to, to see some of those videos you shared with me uh, at one of your presentations. Uh, really great stuff. How much emotional uh, joy, life-changing stuff. You know, you, obviously your clinic's called Changing Faces, right? So um, it, it, it's amazing what you do. I want you to tell the producer, Arty, how you then take that video or take that sort of uh, content that you uh, that, that you make 
turn it into a story, which it is, it's almost automatically a story. It's from some, someone's perspective about how they felt and whatnot and what, what changes are made. I think a lot of dentists struggle. So at the consultation appointment, we're taught, you know, by the gurus that, okay, you know, sh share a testimonial, show a before and after, uh, tell them how awesome you are through, through social proof. It can get very awkward. Oh, let me show you three three examples of people I treated just like you. Bang, bang, bang. But you told me something the other week, and I was like, okay, I need to get you on the podcast to share this with every single person. Can you? Do you remember what it was? Firstly, right? I know. It, can I know you exactly, please? I, I know please exactly what you're talking about. Do it, Jazz. The reason the reason I know this right is because I'm, later on this week I'm going to be speaking at a Noops memorial event, right? Uh, um, in, in in memory of him at the BACD. And I've spent a lot of time with Anoop. Um, he's been to, down to my offices. I've trained his team. I've trained his team at his place. And his favorite thing is this, what I'm about to share with you. Yeah, this it's is mine this, as well. Please, please. This, I mean, this uh, this is, learning, this, learning this from you was my, my favorite thing that I've learned from you so far. This was his favorite thing. Invite your testimonials into the consultation room. Invite your patients into the consultation room. And how do you do that? It's really simple. You just say to the patient, Joanne, I'd like you to meet Sean. Sean's not in the room at this point, right? But it's a really nice way of introducing somebody that you've already treated. And that somebody could be in the form of a Google review. It could be in the form of a before and after, or it could be in the form of a video testimonial you're about to play. And if you say to that patient, Joanne, I'd love you to meet Sean. But before I play his video, let me just tell you a little something about him. He came in here after avoiding the dentist for 20 years. When he came in here, he was a mere fraction of the man he is today. He'd never leave home without his denture glue. He used to take his dentures out to eat his food. His diet was incredibly restricted. And he thought that there's no way he's going to be able to afford the dentistry that he needed. But don't take my word for it. Let's just listen to what Sean had to say about his journey. You press play and Sean deals with every single objection that that patient could possibly come up with, whether it's financial, this, that and the other, right? Um, I can even at that point, believe it or not, you know, when we talk about finance options for patients, right? Can you afford it? Can you take dental finance out, right? Many of our patients remortgage their homes for, for their dentistry, okay? You've never heard anyone teach the concept of asking a patient to remortgage their homes for teeth, right? Because it sounds completely unethical, right? Sounds freaking crazy, right? But Sean remortgaged his home. Neil remortgaged his home. Ellie remortgaged her home. But a really neat way of me explaining that to a patient is to say, do you know what? Sean thought he had no options to afford his treatment. But you know what he ended up doing? Remortgaging his house because that's how important his smile was to him. And that's what Ellie mm -hmm. did and that's what these people did. And I feel that the power of storytelling, <laughs> we talk about having memorable phone calls, right? It's about the memorable consultations. Well, that guy said that the rear implant goes in at 45 degrees and it's made out of titanium and the front ones go in at 90 degrees and then there's this metal bar and then they convert this denture and it's so many millimeters thick and then they're going to put a temporary on and then after the temporary three months later they're going to put a fixed final prosthesis on and all the rest of it and the other patient goes and goes Sean was buzzing his tits off after that he could eat the food he wanted he was living his best <laughs> life he was smiling in front of the camera and he remortgages his house to make it affordable. What are you, you know, uh -huh, what uh -huh. are you going to remember? So, so my biggest tip when it comes to consultations, I can't teach you the clinical stuff. I can't teach you how to write treatment plans, but I think invite your patients to join you in the consultation with the other patient. But the other thing is when you invite that patient in, pick the right patient to invite into the room. Yeah. Sean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sean is a 48-year-old, bald, Birmingham lad, ex-boxer, okay? I am not going to invite Sean into the room when there's a 75-year-old deer there Shirley. sat with her husband. Yeah, right? But I'll bring <laughs> Ellie into the room 
whose husband was a builder and talked about the estimate that we gave them, his version of what a treatment plan was, yeah, and how he finally saw the sparkle in Ellie's eyes after she'd had the treatment. You know, and, 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 and her husband goes to talk about, actually, the biggest difference I saw was in my wife's eyes, right? Now, if he's saying that about his wife and you've got husband and wife in there, I'm inviting Ellie into the consultation. Pick the right patient to invite into the consultation. E extra value added there. I mean, th this is brilliant, guys. Uh, you know, if you are multitasking, I want you to just re rewind five minutes and listen to this again because it's just an elegant way to make a story which is so, so important. Stories are so, so incredibly important. We touched on it in the beginning, but it's, it's a much better way than, I'm gonna show you an example case. Like, it is so much better to personalize, put a human behind it. It just, you know, because we connect with other humans. It's just a better way of giving social proof. So thank you so much, Prav, for very selflessly sharing that. And obviously this podcast is covering uh, breadth. I wish I was joining you on the 15th of July. I'm on a Perio Prosser course. You know how annoyed I was about that. So when you run the second one, I want to be there. Uh, but please tell us about how we can get a little bit more depth uh, on your uh, on your course about growth and, and, and growing as a person, personal development, business. Uh, what's the title? Uh, tell us some more details about that, please. Sort of quickly summarize this. This has been a course in the making for probably the last eight to 10 years. Right. And, and the reason why I didn't launch this course, um, number one, imposter syndrome. Number two, how could I deliver value in a one day two day event or whatever? Right. How, how could I possibly deliver that value? And the most important thing to me, when someone attends a course, right, or a piece of education is execution. Right. Because if you turned up to my course and you walked away absolutely inspired, thinking, fucking hell, that was amazing. I've learned this, 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 and I've got all these notes and it's great. And then you go home and then two months later, you look at the notes and you can't even read your own handwriting. And you're in the same position you was before you attended the course. I failed, failed miserably, right? And so for me, it was about creating something that delivered execution, because as we all know, I know through the IAS Academy, um, I'm close friends with Payman and Dipesh who run the mini smile makeover course and, and, and many educators who tell me that implementation and execution is the hardest thing to achieve in all of this, right? We can all pass knowledge on, that's easy. We can inspire people with our content, but what about getting them to implement and execute? So. Um, the IAS Academy have been asking me to run this course for a long time, um, but I had to just wrap my head around how am I going to get people to implement and execute. So we're going to be starting off with, we call it goal setting, right? And, and, and we're going to plan the next 90 days. I'm, pro I'm going to be sharing with you some of the concepts um, that have been taught to me by my business coaches that I've, I've adapted myself in terms of goal setting, how I do it, how frequently I look at my goals, how I deal with accountability and all of that, right? And then as part and parcel of the course, um, the one thing that I wanted to do is, you know, you turn up at the course on day one in the morning, nobody knows each other, you're saying your hellos, you're getting to know each other, I'm getting to know the delegates. And before you know it, you're two, three hours into the course and you've just started warming up. So prior to the course, we're gonna have a group Zoom session um, where we get to know each other. Um, where I get to understand what you guys are about, prior to that, you will have filled out a questionnaire, a really deep questionnaire. The sort of questionnaire that I share with my one-to-one -one coaching clients. And the purpose of that questionnaire really is to really make you reflect and think about certain aspects of your life. You may not take that questionnaire any further than that. And no one else will have access to those answers other than myself and I won't share them with anyone else, but it's there to make you reflect. During that Zoom call, you can voluntarily share whatever your, your aha moments were from completing that question or if you want to share anything else. There'll be a small coaching session on that Zoom, but the purpose of that Zoom is to leave you with two pieces of homework to deliver on the morning of the course. Number one is prepare your pitch for your receptionist. And number two, Brilliant. prepare your pitch for your patients. The first thing that will happen in the morning is I will coach you through that process. So we perfect your pitches first thing in the morning. We'll go through some goal setting exercises and then moving on into the day, um, I will go through the wheel of life exercise with you and we'll look at balance, right? I think balance is really important. 
for all the reasons we discussed earlier, Jazz, I, I think the, the balance in health, um, finance, relationships, friends, selfish fun, mental and spiritual, all that's really important as a, as a moment of realization, right? Later on, we're going to be talking about um, SOPs or standard operating procedures and, and as a self-employed Not the COVID dentist, kind, yeah. No, 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 definitely. Thank goodness, not. <laughs> definitely not. So you know, I've I've got a I've got a unique way in which you give me a business process, I'll map it out in ten to fifteen minutes very quickly. And anyone who's worked with me knows I can do that. But it's not because that's my unique ability. It's because I use a certain process to map out processes. And I've tried it all: writing operations manuals, doing videos for team members, all the rest of it. I'm going to. I'm just going to share that with you. And you're going to map out a process, a business process or, or some kind of process during that day. I'll share the tools with you that I use for that. And then we're going to talk about taking time out. And taking time out of business or work or life or whatever it is gives you those eureka moments where you can have your best ideas, right? Um, and it's not just whilst you're on the toilet, right? We need scheduled time out. <laughs> away from work so that we can we can we can reflect and we can get those eureka moments right in order for you to take time out you need to be able to delegate effectively um, and whether you're delegating to a nurse a receptionist a practice manager whoever that is um, you need a good delegation strategy and i'll just leave you with this note um, just as a as, as, as a carrot really is that have you ever delegated to somebody thinking to yourself okay that's sorted now i've packed it it's out of my life you come back a week later and you think why has he or she not done that why haven't they done this i asked that person to do this it's not their fault nine times out of ten it's not Gar their garbage fault. in garbage out it's your delegation <laughs> strategy yeah and it's garbage in garbage out absolutely so i'm going to teach you how i delegate which allows me to have that freedom to, to, to have those moments, right? Those eureka moments. Um, naturally, I'm going to be talking about and sharing marketing strategy with you. Um, it's a big part of what I do in my life. So I'm going to be sharing some actionable marketing strategies with you during the day and lots, lots more. Yeah, lots, lots more. Oh, I, I'm gutted I can't make that date, but for the future renditions. But for those who, who can, it's in London, 15th of July. Uh, I'll put the, the, the link on so everyone can click onto it very easily. Uh, I'll put it uh, below here uh, as, as well. Um, anything else that anyone should know uh, either about the podcast or about the, the upcoming course? I think ultimately, you know, I think what you said earlier, Jazz, really resonates, which is, you know, for every clinical course, do a non-clinical course, right? I'm, I'm, 100%. I'm not... And look, I'm not here just trying to pitch my, sell my shit, right? It, it really isn't about that because the time and the effort and the energy that's gone into producing this, I don't want it to be a failure and, and, and I want everyone to execute, right? And I'm going to make damn sure that everyone executes. So after the course, um, I'm going to make, make sure there's some accountability calls thrown into the mix. And that was actually an idea from Jazz when I ran the course by him. He, 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 he's, he, he's a great sounding board, Jazz. And when I designed the course and put it together, um, obviously wanted to get your feedback on it, Jazz. And, and, and the one thing that you said is, look, Prav, if, if you want execution, get some accountability calls in with them. And then I want to know where every single one of you are in 90 days time. So we're going to all come together. Um, it'll, it will be virtually. And I hope, I really do hope um, uh, that, that you are in a different place to where you are today. Um, and I'll end with this, Jazz. Um, my most successful one-to-one -one client who I've been working with for the last 18 months, his name's Ash, father of two six-year-old twin boys. And he came to me working five days a week if I was to compare my clients on a financial basis, he's right at the bottom. He's not earning big money. He's not driving fast cars. He's not wearing expensive watches and he doesn't wear Gucci or Prada either, right? My kind of guy. Yeah. But let me tell you something. Ash came to me and he said, Prav, I want to cash in on that time with my twin boys. And I don't want to miss those moments. So I want to drop my working days from five to somewhere between two and three. I want my income in the practice to remain stable. And if we can get there, that's my definition of success, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where he is today. 
And I would say, you know, we've I've had clients who I've worked with and we've exited their business for multi-million figures, right? Ash is my biggest success story because he's grounded, he's achieved. And do you know what he's doing? He's cashing in on that investment with his children. And when, when he's older, yeah, and when he needs his kids, I truly believe they'll be there for him. I love that. But you messed up the, the story, Prav. You messed it up. Go on. You didn't say meet Ash. <laughs> So it's a chance. I want to meet Ash. <laughs> oh, Thanks, Brad, that was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. There we have it, guys. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. So that M word is meet. You know, meet Sean. I just love that so much. I want before you commit to treatment, I want you to meet Sean. And it's just a great way to then show their Google review or show the photos and stuff. It just personalizes things so much. Look, if you resonated with Prav today, I twisted his arm after he stopped recording. I said, listen, uh, can you please sweeten the deal for the Patrice Rati? You can get 10% off the course with Prav on 15 of July in London and the code of course what, what else would it be it's protrusive the code is protrusive and you get 10% off on the 15th of July so you need to head to no, no, I made it easy for you if you go to protrusive.co.uk forward slash prav that's p-r-a-v that's four letters p-r-a-v it'll take you straight to the page for his course and then just remember to put the coupon code protrusive for 10% off uh, I think this would be great I mean think about how much money we spend on clinical courses if there was one non-clinical course that I want to do at the top of my list is this one. So I can't wait to join you maybe in the next one. I can't be there on the 15th of July. I'm already actually booked on a clinical course, uh, but I'm, I know it's going to build so much value for you. And Prav, thanks so much for sweetening the deal for everyone. I really appreciate that. Guys, I hope you gained so much value from that. I'll catch you in the next one.